Welcome to Prodigal and the Priest and me, a podcast about faith, sports, and two friends from different cultures. I'm Joey Scansella, joined by my co-host, Father Paul Bechter. Father Paul, how's it going? It's going good, Joey. I'm excited. Today What's is up? opening day of baseball. Oh, yeah. That's why you're wearing all that Yankees stuff. I didn't even notice until you said that. Yeah. Pinstripes. Pinstripes. I got this as a wedding present, actually, from my wife. Uh, um... I believe it was a wedding. Yeah, I think she. Yeah. Wow. E- either way, she got it for me. Derek Jeter jersey. It's so, beautiful. Yeah. yeah uh, there Jeter. You go. Can't can't help but respect Jeter, but I grew up just really disliking him. Right. Which you know you love to hate the greats. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, well, today is our episode where we answer questions. We've gotten some really good and unique questions. We're really mm. excited about answering these today and just want to remind our listeners, you want to submit a qu- question, that would be awesome. Go to prodigalandthepriest at gmail.com. Just send us an email or um, you can go to our website, stanamparish.org slash pt p and submit a question there um we really try to do a good job of answering all those questions um or hit us up on our saint Anne catholic instagram facebook any of those send it and they'll uh, forward that over to us so there are some really unique ones let's start with one of the most unique ones uh we had a listener right here from Capel say listen i'm a listener what is your favorite 2d shape yeah i was almost like throw out at I first i was like wait is this spam and it's the greatest like, question <laughs> <laughs> makes me so happy 2d shape so um right off the bat like i'm i've always been drawn to a heptagon um the seven side the seven sided <laughs> um shape you know compared to because most people are like "Ooh, what's that and i just kind of like explaining it it's um, kind of your thing it's kind of my thing so but if I didn't go for the intrigue, definitely be like Pentagon. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I've got a partiality towards triangles being from Bermuda and having this Bermuda triangle thing. We just talked yeah. about that the other day. Make sure to listen to episode 11. Um, but it's kind of a, a love hate thing with triangles because I don't believe in the Bermuda triangle. Mm. Um, Not it, in the triangle aspect. Like well, isosceles, just more in the actual like. It is a triangular shape of ocean right. uh, area, but um, yeah. So triangle, but if I'm allowed to to flex a little bit into 3D just for a moment, like I've always kind of had a thing for. Okay, d- for no one flexes <laughs> into talking about. <laughs> 3D shapes. We'll wait for what I have to say. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, that was a non-traditional use of the word flex. Okay. I meant sort of just yeah, yeah, yeah. segue. Um, okay. But uh, dodecahedron, like when I was in college, I studied physics. Uh, Sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> it's a 12-sided, uh, it's actually called a platonic solid, which I'll tell you about in a minute, I guess. But, um, but we had this computational physics class in uh in college and one of the things that i got to design and code i'm not really good at coding but i learned a little bit in that class right was a dodecahedron which is a a 12-sided 3d shape right it, and all of the sides are the same size for one so it's regular um at each vertex you have the same number of sides meeting it um there's a couple other elements involved in becoming a platonic solid. There's like five platonic solids, I think. Anyway, mm-hmm. you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's fascinating. Yeah, I'm pretending to like listen, but I'm having Just, trouble focusing right now. <laughs> like I never, we had a class called Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry. Okay, we're going to go to and, the next question. <laughs> and I really here. wanted to take it and I never did because it, it wasn't like useful math for physics, but it, it actually is... I don't know. I, I wish I'd taken it because I'm always like sort of fascinated by these things. Right. But 2D shape triangle. 2D shape triangle. 3D. 3D dodecahedron. 12 yeah. sides. It's one of the most stable shapes. 
But uh, okay, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to go. Did people judge that by them. like, oh, yeah. Well, you know, like you're stable. I don't know if you're gonna build a bridge, right? You want the most stable components. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Thing. Like dodecahedrons are very stable. Nice. There's different types of dodecahedrons. By okay, the way, we're gonna go to the next question. Here we go. Thank you to our listener from Capel who submitted this question that brought Amazing so question. much excitement to Father Paul's morning today. Okay, um, let's go to how do I pray, especially during the pandemic, when I'm not still able to go out. So it's in talking in reference to the fact that they are. Um, uh, this person shared in their um, submission that they're still not able to like go out to mass, adoration, mm-hmm. anything like that. Essentially, spiritual aspects here at the church, right? Right. Um, how do they pray during that time? And I know we've talked about prayer a bunch. I think we just <clears throat> want to reiterate and give some practicals. But one thing I want to start with is I think it's especially important when your only place to pray is at home to create a sacred space Mm. in that home to go to. Agreed. I can't tell you how many times I have friends, I have uh, colleagues, different people that saw either their parent, um, somebody else who like, you know, had an area designated, you know, a kneeler, you know, a cross, a statue of Mary, you know, this, this sacred area where they could, you know, it almost brought them a conversion seeing others, you know, Mm on their knees, sitting there, praying, journaling, whatever it is, devoting time to the Lord. So, because I always have a struggle in teens, and especially I'm the youth minister here, so I mostly talk with teens, young adults. They're always just like, yeah, I just have trouble praying. I'm just, you know, and I'm like, well, what do you do? They're like, well, I wake up and I sit up in bed and I'm like, designate a separate spot. Mm -hmm. So I want to start with that, but what are your thoughts? Oh, I totally agree. Just to reinforce that first. Um, Mm -hmm. Like having a place that's set apart and it doesn't have to be complicated or a big place. Even it can be a corner of your room or a part of the wall or something where you hang up a cross or put up a little statue or have a Bible enthroned over there. Like that's, that's what you call it. No, I know. It was just funny. Most (laughs) people aren't like, is your Bible enthroned at home? (laughs) Um, But like having that space from the point of view of building a habit Mm -hmm. um is going to make it so much easier like if you if you just think about working out or something right if you want to have like a place to work out at home and you have to go through a bunch of setup every time right that's going to dissuade you from actually using it if you're able to create a little space where you have like a mat out and some weights or something right um and that's just the workout space you're much more likely to use it more than once right and have a consistent build a consistent habit same with this don't underestimate the value of setting apart a space um yeah for prayer uh the other thing that i would emphasize is setting a schedule i think is super super important yeah um if you can't go out right then you need to find a way to regulate your time um while you're at home yeah and I've always found the Benedictine model to be very helpful, and which so, is yeah, a balance of prayer and work. Okay. Um, and obviously, you know, there's there's leisure and there's stuff in there that you can... But if you think of your day in terms of time for prayer and time for work and trying to strike a balance, it might sound kind of aggressive, like that's a lot of prayer. But, um, but just with that principle in the back of your mind... Uh, these are the things that I would recommend and you can, <laughs> yeah, you can flex. <laughs> I just love this word. I love misusing too, but yeah. uh, you, you can have like, we've lost 30 <laughs> listeners. <laughs> you can, you can have the essentials. Um, and then you can have like a flex option to, uh, to sort of add more on a good day. Right. Um, the essentials really like the foundational this should be prayer time every day is something like 15 to 30 minutes praying Mm -hmm. with a bible just reading the word of god and meditating on it yeah it doesn't have to be complicated it doesn't have to have uh there's plenty of sort of helps you can find for things like lexio divina which means sacred reading which is just a right a series of steps that you would go through but it's as simple as just reading the bible and thinking about and saying how is god speaking to me through his word today and if you're starting with that, I would just toss mm-hmm. out, and you're not used to scripture, 
Start in the New Testament. Yeah, start with the Gospels. Right. Or letters of St. Paul. Yeah, don't start with numbers. Yeah, numbers is good, though. I like <laughs> Debatable. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just yeah. kidding. Yeah, Old Testament's amazing. Right. Or start with some psalms. Right. Um, psalms are psalms are good. Psalms yeah. are really good to pray with. They're made for prayer. And um, we teach our we teach the youth, uh, young adults. We teach a lot of people this. the The acronym joy, or joys, actually Jesus. So, so first, like spend three minutes. So it's broken up three minutes. Um, each one of these sections, three minutes, just speaking the name of Jesus, putting yourself in Jesus's presence. Three minutes praying for others. Three minutes praying for yourself. So O, others, Y, yourself. Mm -hmm. And then S is, last is speaking the praise, either speaking the word of God, reading the word of God, speaking praises to God of thanksgiving and and joy. And so, um, yeah, I kind of like also that model just Mm -hmm. for somebody starting out who's like, I don't know what to do. And it's like, you'll find yourself that three minutes comes up quick and that's just a starting point so that you can build like then add a fourth minute then add a fifth minute then Mm -hmm. you know so um yeah structure really helps structure and as much as it is tough i am mostly a night person if i had to really hone in and own one but becoming a parent i have to be a morning and night person i just find it and maybe it's just me if i wait till the end of the day it is not fruitful I'm tired. And some people here might be like, hey, I'm just the opposite and power to you. If, if that is you, go for it. But the discipline of when I wake up instead of just flipping up my phone and going to Instagram and seeing what stories or what I missed or Twitter or any of that, instead of like sitting in the front room in our, in our sacred space or, or sitting separate from the kids and being like taking that time right then, first thing, Mm -hmm. I just, it's invaluable, um, especially just speaking to all the parents there and really any of us that are just busy working lives, you know, when our day gets going, the last thing we want to do sometimes it's sad to say, but the last thing we think of or want to do is like, I'm going to stop, put myself in the presence of the Lord and pray, you know, and it is a great way to start our day. Yeah, no, it totally is. There is a, a really helpful small book. Mm. Um, which I recommend to a lot of people when they're starting off with this kind of prayer. Um, it's by Ralph Martin, and it's called Hungry for God, Practical Help for Personal Prayer. Um, Hungry for God, Practical Help for Personal Prayer by Ralph Martin. It's not long, at least when I last checked, you can find it on Amazon and stuff. Uh, I think it's really helpful in a, in explaining what the goal of prayer is, which is conversation with God. Yeah. Uh, sounds really simple, but we can get all tied up in our heads and stuff. And right. addressing some of the obstacles and some practical, practical helps for keeping that that time consistent and sacred. Um, yeah, just as we've talked about right now. We also have our Sabbath guide uh, practices, which you can find on our website. Yeah, Saint um, org slash keep dash holy dash the dash Sabbath. <laughs> That was really easy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can um, we add one more dash in? <laughs> please, just end with a dash, a dangling dash. Um, and we've talked about this uh, several times throughout the last couple months in our practice. Um, so if you, we have a, a compilation of past practices, you can scroll through those and, and take a look. Um, yeah. Just the one other thing I want to say on this is like, is like that is the foundational uh, moment of prayer. It really is. Like that's, The most important thing, I think, when it comes to our spiritual life, like those 20 minutes or whatever, especially if they're in the morning, um, they're kind of the pearl of great price. And it's worth selling everything to have that time alone with Jesus. Mm. Um, But if you are, if you have a lot of time on your hands, it's also really, and you can't go out, it can also be very helpful to start setting up other sort of points of prayer throughout the day. Yeah. Um, so that your day kind of hinges on these moments of prayer. Yeah. And they don't have to be long. It could be praying a rosary, praying a chapel of divine mercy, finding a litany or some written prayer that you like to pray and just saying, I'm going to do this at this point. It's really easy to start crowding your day out with a lot of this stuff and then giving up on it wholesale. So I'm not saying like right. get over ambitious about this. Right. But if you are in a situation especially if you're like a teen and you're kind of on perpetual summer right now mm-hmm. um, and you can't go out, like try setting up some points uh, throughout the day 
that you stay faithful to. And there's a great value in just staying faithful to that moment of prayer, yeah. praying a psalm, learning to pray some of the liturgy of the hours. That's what it's made for, Yeah, is to structure your day around prayer. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there to help you with that. Right. Um, but those moments throughout the day are to give kind of structure and remind you of God's presence. You need that that more, even more set apart moment right. uh, that we talked about first, this moment of personal prayer, meditation on the word of God, right. um, preferably in the morning if possible, where it's sort of like you're, you're one-on-one <laughs> yeah. uh, with God every day where there's nothing else going on um, right. and it's just you and him. We need that so much and it's got a transformative value for the rest of yeah. uh, our lives. And I just toss out last, there's this cool uh, video, I believe it's on Facebook and YouTube. There's this priest who does a lot of social media posting. I- I'm blanking where he's at, but he did this cool thing where he mirrored his schedule to the schedule they put out of what Pope Francis does mm-hmm. on a daily basis Mm-hmm. And the Pope, probably one of the busiest people in the Catholic world, three holy hours a day mm. plus mass. Mm. And I'm not saying like, don't confuse that. I'm not telling our listeners, go home, start three holy hours. But I'm just saying whenever we say, oh, I don't really have time, right? It's a matter of priorities. Matter of priorities. Good point to end on. Okay. Um, we got a few more questions to get through here. Um, what is the best part of your job and the hardest part of your job? This goes to both of us. What is our best part of our jobs and the hardest part of our jobs? I'll start um, while you think. Mm-hmm. Um, best part of my job, hands down, seeing people encounter the transforming love of Jesus Christ. I mean, when I've seen somebody hear the gospel message for the first time and never or never even have heard like God loves you so much like that John 316 you know and they get it Mm -hmm. It, it's just to me amazing Um, I would also say in addition to that not that I'm not separating them fully but also when they have a deep encounter of the Holy Spirit for me is is very rewarding because I don't think a lot of Catholics have, like we've talked about in previous episodes, a deep relationship with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And so when I see um, young people, core members, whoever it is, encounter the Holy Spirit in a profound way that transforms their lives, that's the best part. Not just that that encounter happens and it's like, oh, that was nice. They were overwhelmed by the power of God. Like they were overwhelmed by it and they went and they were different. Mm-hmm. Best part of my job. Mm. Yeah. Best part of my job is quite similar, actually. Um, but Copycat. like, yeah. Um, but I'll focus in on the sacramental part of it. Um, things like hearing confessions of people who have had that moment of. I've been away for so long Mm. and I'm convicted now and I want to give my whole life over to God. Like that's so rewarding celebrating sacraments of initiation. Uh, I just got a chance very recently to bring some teens into the church. Um, like last night. Yeah. Like (laughs) last night. And, uh, to, to baptize, confirm, I have extraordinary uh, ability to confirm right now because of the pandemic. The bishop can't go around and do this. And so he's given uh, pretty much all priests in our diocese delegation. So normally somebody like me wouldn't just be going around confirming people. Right. Um, he's also allowing youth ministers to confirm people. <laughs> yeah, false. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I got to baptize, confirm, and give first communion to six sixteens last night. And just... there. There's such a there's such a personal element of faith involved um, in the power of these things, but the, like the sacraments are such privileged channels of grace, and we have this belief that they they do like they do work on their own. Um, mm. And I just every chance I get it, <laughs> I get an opportunity to do something like this. It just reminds me of how powerful God's grace is and what incredible gifts 
he gives us in the sacraments. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, I know this is kind of three things, but they're all kind of the same thing. Like celebrating mass is the best part of my job. It just is like it, it just is. Yeah. Um, there you go. Yeah. Worst part. Yeah. Yeah. This podcast. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> hardest part of my job. Um, it's probably similar to most, like even lay people, their hardest part of their job or, or like non-church workers. Um, I mean by that, um, you know, I, I think the, the roles and the bureaucracy and, and the things that, um, also I think the things that I see keep people from the church, like ours is related to a specific thing, right? Like, I don't encounter many people that say, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm not going to get an Apple or a cell phone because they've hurt me in some way or I misunderstood some teaching or something like this, right? Like they need a cell phone, they go and get it. Our job is so tied to people's experiences, you know, and and maybe in a one split second, they encounter somebody who was rude or mean or something. And that um, I see people like, put off the church and a relationship with Jesus because of an experience like that. And that's, that's tough to encounter that the really the hurt, the pain. And then, like I said, the, I think the bureaucracy at times, the rules that, uh, you know, it ha- you know, it has to go <laughs> like this or do this, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does to me. Um, but you weren't asking me. <laughs> um, True. <laughs> Yeah, the hardest part of my job is, again, kind of similar. Um, it's seeing, like, I hear so many confessions now. Um, like, I don't know, six hours a week, seven, something like that. Um, quite a few confessions, and I can see just so much pain like it's just every day getting this this like hour long dose of people's pain yeah. and like in that pain there's a great opportunity for God's grace to do tremendous things God's yeah. grace abounds in all circumstances but um and so it can it can bring a great joy when you see somebody like turn to God in those moments and experience this this peace and joy even in the midst of a bad family situation or of losing everything in a work situation or um, whatever. But like a lot of people aren't quite there yet and it's not their fault either. And just, just seeing that pain and not being able to being able to, to offer them like the one thing that I know will actually help, Mm -hmm. right? The gospel, um, but not being able to fix the other circumstances. Right. Uh, like there is, I've only been a priest in a parish for one year, but there is something of a father's heart that's starting um, to really take root in me for for my people here. Right. And um, part of that is feeling the pain when you when you're not able to help. Like I I can imagine there's there's an analogy to like, um, I don't know I. I saw one of your kids one time like climb a tree and then cut her hand. Oh um, yeah, Fran. Yep. And she on went, church grounds pursuing. <laughs> church grounds. And I was going to leave her anonymous, but um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she just went from like super happy, watch me climb this tree, right, um, to just like lots of pain <laughs> and confusion. And watching you deal with that was was really cool because you were just like. You're kind of unfazed by it, but also caring. <laughs> if that makes any wow, sense. Wow, you're making me uh, seem really good <laughs> yeah, here. You saw your job in pain, and you're um, like, uh, no, you, you were just calming about. It. You're like, it's gonna be okay. All right, let's take a look at it now. You know, be careful where you put your hands in the future. Yeah, <laughs> but we'll get this bandage up. But like that, when when I'm seeing people in in great pain, or when they're telling me about this great pain, yeah. like. To do something like that, like that's that's kind of all I can do in that situation, right? Is yeah. direct them towards the resources that I know can help with those externals to 
show them how God's grace can work even in the midst of this situation to bring about healing. Um, but I can't do any of that myself. Right. Uh, just like you can't just heal your daughter's like cut yeah. hand in the moment. And that's a painful thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, kind of a long answer, but that's the hardest part of my job. I like it. All right, we got two questions to get through here in a few minutes, so um, we'll probably only get through one, just knowing us. So <laughs> let's go last question, uh, baseball. Um, nice. Because, so like we said, we record these the day before. So today, Thursday, the 23rd <laughs> nice. of July is uh, opening day of Major League Baseball, and somebody asks, what do you all think about the 60-game season and everything that's going to happen this year? You know, so... Um, it's kind of exciting because let's be honest. If and if people aren't familiar with baseball, and some people, obviously, this is my favorite sport. And people all the time are like, "It's so boring. It's so long. It's so this." But to me, it's the things I love. Mm-hmm. The long season that it doesn't matter how you do in the first really sixty, even the first half of the season. Yeah, you could just- like. You look can, at yeah. the season last year. Look yeah. at the Nationals. The Nationals. That's going to be crazy. Mm-hmm. I was trying to find the statistic. My wife sent me this great article from ESPN on just like, it, it's really long. But they talked about like the equivalent of almost like a three-game win, win streak in a 60-game season really equals like, I don't know, something like a 12-game in the regular right. season. Like, <laughs> or like a two-game loss or, or three-game losses like equivalent to 18 game loss or, you know, things like that, that are going to be like, everybody has a shot. Even the team that is like normally like, Hey, we can start out good and we're going to just try our best. Even the Rangers. (laughs) To any of those Rangers. They have a good, they have a good pitching staff. So like, yeah, yeah, they, they do. It's, and it, it makes it exciting. I'm, I'm with you on this. Like I, I do like the long season. I like being able to turn on baseball anytime and just be able to watch some baseball without like every moment counting right um or needing to watch every game which i yeah. definitely can't do but um there is something sort of like playoffish, yeah about starting the 60 game season right now yeah um which makes it exciting i really I really struggle with the extra innings rule that they put in mm. where a man starts on second base once you oh, go yeah. to extra innings. It's like softball, like, old man softball rules. Like, what are we going to start with one strike? <laughs> like, it's like not really. Softball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's not really baseball, but um, yeah. Yeah, but what but about that's the, a different thing. What about the uh, no more pitcher batting in the National League either? Are you fine with the designated hitter? <sighs> I kind of no. liked the difference. I like that I like in the, the World difference. Series. Like there was there was a difference in, you know, the National League ballpark compared to American League. Yeah, I I do I, I do like the difference. Um, I grew up as a National League fan, and so I always disrespected the American League you uh, would. for this designated hitter thing. But I saw a clip yesterday of Shohei Otani, uh, who's healthy now, mm-hmm. right? The pitcher, right? Almost hitting a ball out of Dodgers Stadium. Like in batting practice, but right. still, like you, do you put him in when he's not pitching right. as a designated hitter or something like that? Right. Um, like you lose that dynamic of this like unicorn pitcher who can actually hit, and of all the strategy um, behind, you know, what do you do with the one guy who's terrible at hitting in your lineup? Right. Um, I I like all that, and so I'm not a huge fan of just it's. This would lead us too far astray, I think, but it's kind of the the whole sort of pandering to like the most powerful and exciting parts of baseball to try and make it more palatable. Yeah. Right? Like, let's design stadiums so that they're easier to hit home runs in because home runs make people interested in baseball. Right. Um, let's take out some of these boring parts, which for more baseball purist types are like kind of the interesting parts because yeah. they're strategy parts. Yeah. Um, Let's take out some of those, and now everybody's capable of just hitting a home run on every at-bat or striking out, and that's... Right. Yeah, I don't know. 
not so, crazy about it, but I love the 60 game season for this year right? because it really does make it exciting. And I just, I'm so happy there's sports. Yeah. So like we got like 30 seconds. So real quick answers. Um, do you think though this puts, puts, blah, blah, blah. do you think this puts an asterisk on this season? Like say, uh, say, I don't know, the Orioles <laughs> who like are, I think one of the worst teams in baseball, um, they win. Will people right. be like, ah, it was only a 60-game season? I think that some people will. I think that more people won't. Um, I think the Orioles will probably celebrate it <laughs> just as much. Um, <laughs> don't worry, like, folks. We don't have to worry about that happening. Yeah, Sorry not if actually there's any It's going to be Yankees-Dodgers in the World Series. I was going to ask. That was the second question. So who are you calling? Uh, I don't care for the Dodgers, and so I'm actually going to go Yankees. It's a this is this is a shocking so, reversal. So you're if you going know me at all. you're going yeah. Yankees versus Dodgers in the series, yeah. World Series. Um, yeah, I hope that it's the the Yankees Astros to get to the World Series again, just so <laughs> that like Houston can like feel like, like everybody can feel like we've played this out for real now mm-hmm. without the whole cheating scandal and all of that. And of course, you know, I'm a Yankees fan. I'm going to say that you know it's going to be the Yankees, and I want to see the Yankees. Um, but I'm also a realist and they got a great lineup. Yeah, so they do. So just back real quick to that, um, asterisk point, mm-hmm. maybe in the short term, but I think once you get five or 10 years out from this, people just look at lists Yeah, and I don't think that those lists will include an asterisk okay. on this season. Yeah. So I'm also, um, <sighs> torn. You know what I would love to see? Yankees Cubs. Okay. I it's not going to happen, but I do actually think the Dodgers pose a great opportunity to go. So, um Yeah, let me back off the Yankees and say actually Rangers are my pick. But got to got to homer this a little <laughs> bit. But. That's right. Well, everybody, uh, we, we're going to save our other question for next time. So we have a bunch more, but remember to reach out to us at our, uh, website, at our, uh, Gmail account. And, uh, we thank you so much for listening to prodigal and the priests and me take care. God bless.